The scripture, I will tell you that we're calling January the month of consecration. And of course, we ought to be consecrated all year to the Lord and to His service. But we're putting special emphasis on consecration in the month of January. I'm going to be inviting you to fast once a week for the entire month of January. I'll be preaching a sermon on New Year's Day, Lord willing, called On the Fast Track. Where I'll teach about fasting as part of this Sermon on the Mount. We'll get right there at the right time. And then I'm going to ask you to consider fasting every Thursday of the month of January. And for some of you, that will be a brand new discipline. And then later on in the year, we'll maybe do a, a seven-day fast, where for seven days you only drink beverages, but you do not eat solid foods. Except those of you who have a medical uh, condition where you must eat, and we certainly don't want you to violate your doctor's uh, orders, uh, and you, you certainly must make sure you're fit for that and ready to do that. Uh, but I want you to be thinking about fasting and particularly about that discipline and join me as we engage ourselves in a church-wide fast uh, the month of January. I'll be teaching on that on the first Sunday of the year, Lord willing. Now if you're able, would you please stand for the reading of the Word of God, which today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. I want to read the first four verses from the New King James Version, Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, we continue this series in the Sermon on the Mount. This is, in case you're keeping track, part 17. We'll be in it a while. The Sermon on the Mount is that body of teaching of Jesus's that is comprised or contained in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Hear the word of the Lord, Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 1 from the New King James Version. Jesus is speaking. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. And your father, who sees in secret, will himself reward you openly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Don't go anywhere, Paul. Just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just have this, this chorus on my mind. I want to remind myself that all of you just put me in the PFG, please. Say yes. 
We acknowledge our need before you. We need you every hour, every minute, every day, every second. May not a day go by where we do not acknowledge our need before you. You are our hope. You are our joy. You are our strength. We come to thee. Oh, bless us now, we pray. May we know your power. May we know your word for us today. May we receive it with gladness. Open our ears, we pray. Our hearts, our minds. We say yes in advance to what you're going to say. We acknowledge our need. We give you praise and thanks. In the name of Jesus, thanksgiving, we pray. Everybody said Either way, it's a case of 
Hey, look at me. Listen to this horn blast. I'm giving 200 denarii for the building of a house for the poor. You can picture them in Jesus' day, can't you? But it's not far removed from today, is it? Not uncommon for people to give to the hospital's capital campaign, but only if their name will go on the plaque in the lobby of the hospital. We'll give to the Atlanta Symphony, but only if our names appear in the back of the program as benefactors. We'll give to NPR, but you must make sure you call our name out on the air during the fun drive. We'll even give to the church. But there has to be some recognition of some kind. Pastor, I need you to know, I'm giving. Jesus says that's exactly what hypocrites do. Yes. All through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has, has been arguing for the distinctive radical life. You remember in his words, well, let me take you to it in chapter 5, verse 20. I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you hear it? I want you guys to be different and better than those folks around us that you're seeing. Or if you're still in chapter 5, look at verse 47. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? He says, I, I want you to live differently than tax collectors. I want you to do better. I want your righteousness to be distinct from and better than and exceed the righteousness of the tax collectors, of the scribes and the Pharisees. He has been arguing for this very different life. And he does not expect that we will take our cues from the watching culture and we will look like them. We will look different from them. We'll do the opposite of the tax collector, of the scribe, of the Pharisee. Be careful here. Jesus is not teaching that what you give should not ever be seen. That, that's not what this passage is saying. He's not suggesting that your gift can never be noted. <coughs> Pastor Farr, where did you get that? Seems to me, right here, he's saying everything should be done in secret. Well, no, it's not true. Uh, go with me to Mark chapter 12. Let me show you a story that you might remember, we'll come right back to Matthew 6, Mark chapter 12. I want to remind you of a story you know, and I want to share one insight to it. Now, Mark 12, let's skip down to verse 41. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury, and many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had her whole livelihood. I simply want to point out that not only did Jesus see her giving, but he commented on it. It was not done in secret. It was a public offering, and Jesus took note of it there while he was standing there, and also took his disciples aside and commented on it. I want to suggest that not all giving is done in secret. Some giving is made public. It is not forbidden. I was reading in Acts chapter 4 last night, just as I was tweaking these notes, and I was reminded that Barnabas sold land, gave the proceeds to the early church, and it was made known. Acts chapter 4, the end of the chapter, verses 36 and 37. That wasn't done in secret. No, the problem here in Matthew 6, back to our text, was not that the offering should never be seen. It was that some were giving in order to be seen. There's a difference. 
It is a matter of motivation. Jesus warns us to avoid the example of the hypocrites. The Greek word for hypocrite is translated actor. One who puts on a mask and plays a role and is not him or herself. That's an actor. And the hypocrite is one who acts like something else is true when actually the reality and the truth is over here. And there were people who were giving in Jesus' day and they were not giving out of their authentic selves. They were giving in order to be seen and they were putting on a mask and they were acting, they were actors, they were acting like generous givers to the cause but they were really just giving in order to be seen. Look at me, I'm giving, was their idea. Jesus is calling us not to give all that we give without being seen. He's calling us to do everything we do, when we do what we do, to do everything as authentically as possible, without faking it ever. Be real in your giving, in your doing charitable deeds. So then, what is the way we should do what we do? The answer is in verse 3. Jesus calls for discretion. But when you do a charitable deed, that is when you do what you do, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Jesus is suggesting that discretion always, always takes precedent over demonstration. And that privacy will often replace proclamation. I'm sure a few of you are ahead of me and thinking, wait a minute, this passage contradicts chapter 5 verse 16. Aren't we told to be out there and let our light shine before a watching culture? Aren't we supposed to be visible in all things and not hide our lights under a bushel, Pastor? Yes, that is correct. But I hear your silent questions. So then which is it, Farmer? Are we supposed to let our light shine with our deeds? Or are we supposed to be very quiet and discreet and not let our left hand know what our right hand is doing? The late John R. W. Stott, addressing this, says that Jesus is really addressing two different sins in those two different passages, in Matthew 5, 16, and here in Matthew 6, 1 to 4. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, Jesus is addressing the issue of cowardice and embarrassment. Those of you who don't want to ever talk about your faith, let your light shine so that people can see it. And don't hide it under a bushel. Be salt, be light. Be a beer nut for Jesus. <laughs> Create thirst out there in the world. But in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is addressing the issue of vanity. And stopped in his commentary, quotes A.B. Bruce, who says, and this is a great line, he says, so are we supposed to be visible or invisible? And he says, and this is a great principle, you should show when tempted to hide, and you should hide when tempted to show. <laughs> you should show when tempted to hide, let your light so shine, and you should, Ephraim, I'm going to take this off. This keeps slipping. Let's, let's go right to this. <coughs> you should show when tempted to hide. And when you are tempted to be boastful, you should hide when tempted to show. Here in Matthew 6, we have those who are just all too eager to show. Jesus said, now you should be very discreet. Those of you who don't want anyone to know what you support and what you believe and how you use your resources, you should let your light shine. You should be out there. You're too timid. Maybe it's both and. 
maybe per situation, there are times when we ought to give, and we ought to give hilariously, and we ought to give publicly. Then there are times when you are too full of yourself. You need to give and not let anybody know. Maybe it's both. Sometimes our giving is a needed witness to those who are watching us closely. There are some who need us to set the pace for them. They're watching us. So here the problem is not of pride, of arrogance, but here the problem is that of pride and arrogance and grandstanding. And Jesus says, you people need to check yourselves. But let me give you the other side. Suppose you have a young person in your house. They've just gotten their first job. And they've come home with their first check. And after they ask, who the heck is FICA? <laughs> and they realize they could get all the money they were thinking they'd get. Then you sit down with them. You say, you know, honey, I have committed myself to giving 10% of my income to the Lord. Let me show you. Here are the canceled checks from the last year. I'd like to challenge you to do the same. I don't need to be letting my son know my business. Well, no, here you might well make it public because it will be a help to him or her as they set out their own paths and how they're going to handle their resources. Then you should make it known. There is not an instance of, oh no, right, the Bible said let, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. No, here you want to let your light shine. Amen. You, want to, you want to make sure they know what you stand for. So sometimes your giving should be out there, out loud and proud. And there are other times when you do want to keep everything close to the chest. Depends on the situation, doesn't it? Yes. But let me give you three things that Jesus is suggesting in this text. First, check your motive. Why are you giving? Why are you praying? Why are you assisting that person? Why are you giving so many hours of community service? I heard about a young lady who was dating a, a ne'er-do-well. Well, she was dating a loser. Let's just say it. Let's just say it. <laughs> <laughs> And her father disapproved of the young man she had chosen. And the father said to the young lady, I just don't like him. I just don't, I think he's a sleazy guy and he's going to disappoint you. He's going to take advantage of you. I just don't like him. I don't trust him. <coughs> she said, Daddy, he's a wonderful person. He said, well, I, how do you know and on what do you base that? She said, well, if he's not a wonderful person, then why is he doing 300 hours of community service? <laughs> Motivation. Are you doing what you're doing because the probation officer said you had to? <laughs> or are you doing what you do because you really want to simply be used by God to relieve human suffering, to help people, to proclaim the gospel? Check your motive. Why do you do what you do? Did you sell that piece of land and give the proceeds to the cause of Christ because God had blessed you? Because you see that you could be useful, or did you give it in order to be seen? Are you Barnabas, or are you some person that blows his or her own trumpet? Check your, your motive. Second, check your message. What, what are you saying by what you're doing? What are you saying by what you're doing? What message are you sending when you do what you do? Third, check your expectation. Are you expecting accolades from this act? Are you expecting your name to be called, or a pat on the back, or some publicity? In Dallas, Texas, where I used to live, I was at a large convention, and there was a guy there who was bucking for a promotion in the organization in which, uh, of which he was a part. And when it came time for the offering, at this large religious convention. And I, I was there, I saw this. This is not something somebody told me. The man got up and they took the offering. The man got up from his seat, he reached in the bag, and he took out a stack of bills, $5,000 in cash, and he strutted. 
over to the offering and they said, I want to give $5,000. And we didn't need to know that. And we didn't need to see that. But I thought, my, that, that is a bit flashy and over the top. What are you expecting when you give your dollars? What are you expecting when you give your hours in service? When you exercise the call to stewardship, what are you expecting? Now this passage ends with a bit of a surprise. If we will do what we do, free of ulterior motives, God will reward us, says verse 4. This sounds like an incentive swap. We should not do what we do looking for the approval of human beings, but if we do our charitable deeds discreetly and with pure motives, God will reward us. Oh, well there we go. I don't want human reward, but I certainly would like the reward of God. So in this skewed example, one could still be accused of doing good with not the purest of motives. I want God to see what I'm doing. I want him to say, well done. This time, we seem to be working for God's reward. Isn't that still a bit suspect? Proverbs chapter 19, verse 1. In fact, it's, it's such a good verse. If you're taking notes, why don't you put this down? Proverbs 19, 17. It's a one-liner. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. So some people do their charitable deeds. They do what they do so that they can see Proverbs 19, 17 come to life. I'm going to give to the poor, I'm going to do my charitable deed, and then God is going to reward me. So Pastor Farmer, I'm, I'm good because I'm not going for the notice of human beings. Yeah, but you're still not authentic in your motivation. You're, you're still looking for a pat on the back, but this time from God. We seek the good of others, and we are rewarded. Here's what makes this different. Verse 4 is different because the reward of God is that which happens to us and which comes to us when we're not looking for it and working for it. Mm -hmm. It's a bonus which God simply provides. C.S. Lewis, Clive Staples Lewis, a great writer. You, you, you ought to have at least one piece of writing of C.S. Lewis in your library. C.S. Lewis, Oxford philosopher, great, great writer, 1898 to 1963. You read some of his work. He has an essay called The Weight of Glory. And in The Weight of Glory, he addresses this idea of rewards. <clears throat> Listen to Lewis. We must not be troubled by unbelievers when they say that this promise of reward makes the Christian life a mercenary affair. There are different kinds of reward. There's the reward which has no natural connection with the things you do to earn it. And it is quite foreign to the desires that ought to accompany those things. Money is not the natural reward of love. That is why we call a man a mercenary if he marries a woman for the sake of her money. But marriage is the proper reward for a real lover, and he's not a mercenary for desiring it. Then I have this underlined in my notes, highlighted in my notes. I'm going to read it slowly. This is C.S. Lewis continuing. Last sentence. The proper rewards are not simply tacked on to the activity for which they're given, but are the activity itself in consummation. Listen to what he's saying. We, we don't work for the rewards. The proper reward is not a tack on, a medal or a ribbon that you get at the end that you've been trying to earn. The proper reward is the activity itself in consummation. That is, when we do what we do with a pure heart, 
That is itself the reward. And on top of that, God rewards us. Wow. Earlier this year, after 66 years of serving people in Decatur and Tucker, Georgia, the Rehoboth Presbyterian Church closed its doors. The congregation was dwindling. They had financial needs they couldn't meet. And they decided to simply close the church. It's on Lawrenceville Highway. The church put out a word that all its furnishings, all its office equipment, and a lot of the physical assets, in fact, we got this paramet, and the table, and the table covering for the communion table from the Rehoboth Presbyterian Church. A few of our members went over there and got some items that were being given away, first come, first serve basis. Suppose a person who had given money to the Rehoboth Presbyterian Church, let's say 60 years ago, went to that day of giveaway and said, hey, I gave $10,000 for these pews, and now that you're closing, I want a refund. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to those gold and gray name plates with my name on them? And how's anybody going to know what I did? If you're going to give away the pews and take the name plates off, I want a refund. And we would think that was laughable and inappropriate, wouldn't we? No. When we do what we do, we don't seek a refund or a newspaper announcement. We do what we do because God has called us to service and to investing all that we have in his cause. And we receive God's smile. We receive his well done. But that is not what we work for. We don't need ribbons or medals or certificates or trumpet blasts. We simply need the good night's sleep that comes to those who know that they have done what God called them to do. We have been sensitive to the poor. We have served them. We have shared our resources with them. We have invested in the kingdom of God. Recently, I preached for the 17th anniversary of a church that was planted by a friend of mine. I've known this guy for 30 years. And then on the occasion of his and the church's anniversary, I said to the congregation, I don't know anything about Michael Henderson's money, his investments, his finances, but I know a lot about his investments. I know what he invests in. He invests in people, and he invests in ministry. Hey, you. I don't know anything about your finances, but I would like to begin to know about your investments. I'd like to know what you're giving yourselves to. And so would Jesus. How do you give? What do you give? With what motive do you give what you give? With what heart do you do what you do? And when you do what you do, is God honored? Or do you get all the glory? Simply want to go to sleep at night knowing I have been obedient to God. I have been pure in my motive. I've been pure in my heart and in my mind. And that is a reward in and of itself. When we do what we do, let us pray. Search our hearts, O oh God, and renew a right motive in us, we pray. We confess that at times we have blown our own horns and have drawn attention to ourselves when we should have been very discreet. And we also confess that we have been too discreet when we should have been blowing a trumpet and declaring what you have done. Teach us the balance between these two texts in Matthew 5 and 6. May our lights shine when they need to shine. And may we be 
not bragging, but we need to be not bragging. We pray for ourselves, for this family of believers known as Crossroads, that you would help us to be people of pure and holy and godly motives. We pray for those who have never given sacrificially or substantially of their resources of any kind. They don't give up their hours. They don't give up their dollars. They don't share their gifts. Would you please do in them what I cannot do in them? Would you please address that in their lives? In the name of the Lord Jesus. We pray for those who are excited because you are changing them. And you are teaching them. We thank you for what you are up to in our lives. We have sensed, many of us, a great release in our spirits. As you do your mighty work, we've watched you make a way where there seemed to be no way. We've watched you bring us from a long way. We've watched you turn what looked like failure into success. We've watched you fill the bag that had holes in it so that we now have substance and we thank you. We've watched you turn our mourning into dancing and our sorrow into joy. And we thank you. We've watched you turn us into trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. And we thank you. And we pray that you'd apply this text to our hearts. May we not work for your reward, but may we see your reward as we work. Help us. May we be delivered from any mercenary motivations. May we serve you because you've called us to do so. May we serve the poor because you've called us to do so. May we give of our resources because you've called us to do so. May we look for ways to serve you without compulsion. May we be driven by obedience, we pray. We shall have our door thee and give thee glad praise in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In that name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Before we sing this final hymn, perhaps you're here today, sir or madam, and you'd say, Pastor Farmer, I'll tell you right now, I don't do any of this stuff that you talk about in Matthew 6. I don't do charitable deeds. I don't give to the poor. I don't give alms. I don't share myself. I'm, I'm very self-centered, Pastor Farmer. I'm, I must admit that today. But what you've said is intriguing. I, I would like to talk with someone about how I could begin this life that you're describing. We have people here who could spend a few minutes with you this morning and more time with you later on. As you surrender yourself to Jesus Christ, who wants to give you a different life, a life not like the life of others that you've seen, from whom you might be taking your cues. As we sing this final hymn, I lay my sins on Jesus. And I'll sing it right from the front down here on the floor. If you would like to speak with a counselor about how you might come to know this Christ, while we're singing, you come, I'll be happy to receive you. You'll sit down here on the front row. I'll have a brief prayer with you, and then I'll assign you to a person who will speak with you. As we're singing, you come. Saying by your coming, Pastor Farmer, I, I really need to simply get, get life right with God. Secondly, you might be here, you say, I'm already a believer, but I'm drawn to this church, this body of believers named Crossroads. We're not a perfect church, but we are a people serious about following Christ. And if you would like to explore what it means to unite with this church, you also come while I'm standing, make your need known, We'll make sure you get someone to speak to.
Let's stand if you're able. Let's sing. I lay my sin before Jesus. God smile when you do what you do. Amen. 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 Still hanging back there. Did it come on? Oh, there we are. 